Uncuckables. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Uncuckables uh, for another week. I'm Tim Wilms, editor in chief of the Unshackled. I'm here in the studio. Well, the reason why we're starting 10 minutes late is... I was though, on time. No, you were late. I was on time. Come on. Well, I was here before. I was here before. Like you could have, every, you could have everything started. rolling. You could have everything You're rolling. You're already a I just week late up. from last week. You're already <laughs> running a week late. I'm a week early for next week, man. <laughs> <laughs> next week, yes. Well, you are back here permanently now. Yeah, I'm back. Uh, rain, hail or shine, I'm back. I appreciate the time off, actually. It was uh, quite refreshing. Yeah, and I, I appreciate everybody's comments um, saying they want to be back too. So thank you uh, very much, everybody. I had a bit of time off uh, during January mm. uh, as well, sort of still part-time uh, with the Unchecko because there was plenty of news and of course the left didn't stop uh, hyperventilating which we'll get uh, the, uh, left, into, the left never stop uh, yeah. in a moment yeah. uh, but we've also got uh, for, the, for the first time on the the Uncuckables uh, Bradley chairman of the the WA Australian Protectionist uh, Party welcome thank you very much Tim it's uh, a pleasure to be here I've uh, been a big fan of your show for um, quite a while now and I've sort of been itching to get on so uh, here we are it's good that our show we we have we, we don't have to go out and seek people to come on they come to us now because we've we've had a few requests from people now yeah i'm quite enjoying it and we should say to everyone happy uh, belated uh, australia day we know that wa is in a different uh, time zone australia day's past there hasn't it because your public holidays are in different <laughs> times <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's half past, what is it, 5.42 p.m. here, according to my clock. So, um, yeah, we're three hours behind you guys, normal too, but um, you have uh, daylight saving and we don't, so we're three hours behind. And, yeah, Australian Day is all over here. I've got to say, in, in the current year clown world, um, saying that a, a certain area of the country is behind the times isn't really an insult anymore. It just means they've got more time before the collapse. Well, it doesn't, uh, do, uh, the reason why I said uh, if you've had Australia Day yet, because doesn't WA have Queen's Birthday, Labor Day at different times? Yes, I think that's correct. Um, yes, that's right. We do have Queen's birthday, I think, is in October, if I recall. Completely different. Because we have um, what's known as WA Day, or what's known as Foundation Day, which is uh, the first uh, Monday in June. And um, the Queen's birthday is sort of like the second Monday in June. And so they didn't sort of want two weeks in a row where we have two Monday public holidays. So I think that's why we sort of changed it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it used to be called Foundation Day. And then a few years ago, they, uh, Colin Barnett, who was the former West Australian Premier, decided to change it to WA Day because he thought it would be more marketable, I suppose. But, um, yeah, I didn't have a huge, strong opinion one way or the other. But, um, yeah, it is a, it is a significant holiday for Western Australia. So, um, yeah, we don't have the two Mondays in a row. We have, um, you know, I think it's October. I think my Queen's birthday is in WA, so that's how it is. Just to see you didn't be done with it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because you've all, you, if you've got WA Day and you do a ton of things differently, they're, they're still, it's never going to go away, the WA secessionist uh, movement, I'm not sure what your perspective is Don't encourage that. them. We're relying on Western Australia. Oh, so you're happy to be a leech? <laughs> yes, we need them. Well, actually, you know, maybe it'd be better for the country. Secede, it's accelerationist. Do it. <laughs> yeah, look, if you want my honest opinion on that, um, I don't think there's any real desire for that at all, to be honest. I think, I mean, West Australians are certainly very what I'd call parochial, you know, we're very sort of proud of being West Australian, but at the same time, I think we're also very proud of being Australian. I, mm. I, I don't think there's any real desire at all to, well, I mean, okay, we sort of like, you know, our own resources and we sort of like to have a bit more money over this side of the country and that sort of thing. But for the most part, I think, you know, any talk about secession is really, there's just no real public support for it at all. I think, you know, West Australians are, you know, we're, we're, we're very close to the rest of Australia culturally and emotionally and all that. So I just don't think it's going to happen. Mm. Uh, now, we are live on the Uncuckables YouTube channel and also on the Uncuckables uh, D-Live channel. Uh, if you're in the, the live chat 
out uh, on YouTube. I've put the, the Entropy uh, link there, which is the, the YouTube Enhanced software, where you can uh, come over and uh, you can answer our poll, uh, which we'll get to in a moment. You can ask us uh, a question, and uh, best of all, you can send through a super chat uh, to support the production of this show. Now, I know that there's uh, a lot of people who say they can't get onto the new Entropy because there, there was a software uh, update at the, the end of uh, last year. I don't know how to fix it because it works for, for me on, on my iPad and, and desktop. What about you, Dave? I've never actually been able to get onto it on Boomer Tech. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Bradley, what about have you tried to get on the new Entropy? No, I'm afraid I haven't. I absolutely cannot be on any help there at all. Okay. But yeah, works for me and a few other people. We, we need Mark Collett, to, he's sort of like the ambassador for Entropy to oh, just right. sort of tell us how exactly we get around it. Is there nothing that guy can't do? <laughs> yes. Superman. Well, yeah. well, he was on your sh uh, XYZ Live last week. I'm hoping to have him uh, mm. on an uh, upcoming episode of Wilmsfront. Because Magnificent. Sort of, yeah, good. Mm, good. Because when well, he made his uh, debut to Australian audiences through The Uncuckables, and <laughs> Maddie and I have very different interviewing styles. Yeah, that was a lot of fun watching that. <laughs> mm, yeah, I, it makes good audience uh, theatre, but you yeah. can tell, like, I just wanted to ask him, like, a whole bunch of other things. Maddie yeah. always detours on... Oh, well, yeah, I need to watch the archive of this show to know how things work. Yeah, you know what you're getting. You know what you're getting with that. Mm. And on DLive, you can send through lemons, which are the, the currency, a cryptocurrency of the, the platform. And then it works out to uh, there's 10 lemons e equal one ice cream, and then 100 lemons equal a diamond. 1,000 lemons, uh, it's a, what's it, Ninja Guinea, and 10,000. Uh, lemons are a, a, a ninjet. Do we ever get money? Uh, there's the lemon balance up there. Don't reveal it. Okay, sure. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Okay. Because you might, I don't know if you're one of those stupid people that reads out sensitive information. No, I'm not. There. No, no. I, uh, f the, f when I used to do was that those trivia nights, there'd always be some idiot on your table who, when the question, they'd yell it out and so the rest of the, <laughs> the people on the other tables, <laughs> I wanted to, to smack them. <laughs> so em. no. Like, like I, I got tri uh, pub trivia night rage. <laughs> you never go to the trivia night with the village idiot. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> you'll never win and keep the answer to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what I, uh, as a good segue, uh, WA seems to be where all the cool Australians are. Obviously, uh, Gina Reinhart, Australia's uh, uh, biggest uh, taxpayer. Uh, she is based over in uh, WA. Well, she is, well, she's... <laughs> As a person, she's slimmed down now, but she right. still uh, gives the all those uh, lefties, uh, a lot of them take uh, government grants and, and checks, so they'd be getting some of uh, uh, Gina's uh, money. She's buying their big uh, But from, it's also yeah. the home of uh, Margaret Court, who, well, it's the 50th anniversary of her four Grand Slams in a single calendar year in, in 1970. And of course, uh, the, the Australian Open, they chose to recognize but not celebrate her yeah well let's get this straight off the bat um women shouldn't be allowed to play sport it takes away from their primary duty as mothers and uh and to you know secure the existence of our people in the future for white children having said that margaret court is pretty based yeah. uh, should women be ministers as well no no they should absolutely not but she is a minister no yeah yeah she should be stepping down from that <laughs> i agree disagree with that too yeah uh, so that brings us to our poll question for tonight. Uh, is Margaret Court right about everything? <laughs> I'd have to say most things, yeah. Because, well, she... The, the main reason, well, it's over the past decade, she's been uh, condemned and uh, criticised is because, well, uh, she was vocal that uh, Australia shouldn't legalise uh, same-sex marriage because she supports a biblical uh, definition uh, of marriage and uh, she believes that uh, sodomy uh, is a sin and she's against obviously uh, gender ideology mm. uh, transgenderism and safe schools program which she described uh, gender ideology being taught to, uh, to students as the the devil and safe schools uh, brainwashing children that's what hitler did um yeah it's it's what stalin did it's what mao did it's what um pol pot did um 
she she's good um she she's one of the few people in the public sphere who is not afraid to say it like it is um it's interesting how uh it's always the left always seem to go after one person at a time like it's very alinsky-ish like they always try to isolate an individual well, like they're... last last year it was israel Folau. at the moment you know like because the australian open is on like all the pressure is on margaret court everybody's talking about margaret court um it is it, it, there are just a few public figures who are actually like willing to actually um tell the truth and they they, they get slammed well she re introduced herself into the the public arena rightfully because mm. it, it is the 50th anniversary of the four grand slams yeah. uh wins in this in a single year and let's go through her career achievements she's won 24 uh singles grand slam titles no one male or female has ever beaten that and she's mm. won if you combine singles uh women's doubles and mixed doubles she's won 64 uh grand slams no nobody will ever beat that like, yeah. that's, it's, it's that's, quite inconvenient isn't it yeah it's yeah. amazing uh, achievement and i was watching the the other night because probably the uh, to, to get those four grand slams in the calendar year the the biggest uh uh final of that was the 1970 wimbledon final against uh billy jean uh king who mm. is now one of her lesbian opponents in the <laughs> in the politico uh, sport world that explains it's, those funny looking photos uh, yeah that, okay. that's considered one of the greatest uh tennis matches of of all time yeah right i think we've, we've got footage of um some of that like it's uh oh yes yeah um because what's going on with margaret court is quite soviet like i i've even seen like a headline saying that um that the all the tennis stars are having to tiptoe very carefully around the issue of margaret court <laughs> as, as though it's like just commonly accepted that she's the devil yeah um and she's the worst oh, yeah. so person this is in from the world the, the 1970 uh wimbledon final this that's the margaret match, court yeah. on the left uh billy jean king on the right yeah so uh, um uh in the very near future we expect yeah the that's the 1970 like, photo uh, we'll have a look at the, yeah. the 2020 photo yes uh, so this is the the modified and we should give credit to credit to ryan fletcher yeah for this. yeah yeah this is the the updated 2021 <laughs> yeah yeah that's just uh billy jean king just um walking out by herself nobody mm. knows who she was up against um she won <laughs> yes she and she always won so they'll have to basically re-edit like the final footage where she was seen being a sore loser after she lost absolutely absolutely yeah but this, 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 like you said it's inconvenient of well they're, they're going to try but nobody can take away all of those titles that yeah she won i mean yeah. you can try and delete somebody from history as the soviet union tried to do with lesser individuals but that's gonna that record's gonna stand the 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 test of time and it doesn't matter what new life she has here's the thing though it it, it doesn't have to stand the test of time um, i'm just saying it will stand the test of time i can say it's not going to be in my lifetime someone's going to beat that no oh no, no. well well that, that yeah the actual record itself yeah but um w what we found out is that um you know the powers that be are very good at disappearing our history as well as our people as well as people um all you have to do is not teach it for a little while um you just have to change the narrative about it um you know like th there are a lot of sort of when i was a kid like there are a lot of people who like i knew who they existed but like the kids of today they don't know who this person these people were mm. so it's not that hard to erase the memory of mm. somebody uh, it's also been revealed that uh margaret court uh is a as a racist because she supported apartheid in south africa the, because when they're yeah. going after somebody they dig up uh, anything that they, they can so let's let's have a look at what she said about south africa they're, they're doing all in that work for us. It's, it's actually quite great margaret court the great australian tennis player i have no problem at all with south africa's racial exclusions i love south africa she told the new zealand herald i have many friends there of course i will keep going to play it's a tragedy that politics has come to sport but if you ask me south africa is the racial situation rather better organized than anyone else certainly much better than the united states she was absolutely spot on yeah. well i've oppose apartheid on well, individual liberty grounds but you can probably 
uh, argue that uh, South Africa in 1970 was a much more harmonious place than it is in 2020. Absolutely. So in that case, why, how can you possibly oppose it on on individual liberty grounds when, like, like the actual system was like far better than now? Well, like, it was certainly individual a wealthy, liberty. wealthier yeah. uh, place, it, and and it was a better place for black people too. Well, yes, because crime. It has skyrocketed yeah. uh, since the, the end of apartheid and well, the its economy has collapsed. Hmm. Yeah, hence you, you, you can't make the individual liberty argument with this. It's just, it was just There's, like there, categorically well, better. Principles are important. Yeah. I mean, you're making a utilitarian argument. Yes. Mm. Which is what well, you make a convincing case. Yeah. Yes, uh, I do. Uh, Bradley, uh, Western Australia has a large uh, South Africa expat population, basically, because it is the the closest uh, white uh, settlement area to uh, South Africa. Yes, that's correct. Um, there's quite a few South Africans, I believe, in Western Australia. I can't honestly say that I've had a great deal to do with them myself, but I'm told that there's definitely out there. and. Um, as far as you know like apartheid was concerned i mean obviously that was 50 years ago and uh, such a long time ago such a, a different world back then and um you know i think it's very very easy to judge 1970 by the standards of today sort of thing and um you know i mean but you know that's what people will do they'll sort of you know try and drag up any statement that might have been said a long time ago to try and you know demonize that person that's what they're doing with margaret court i mean just getting back to margaret court i mean margaret court is obviously a um let's call her a conservative christian and um well i guess obviously we're living in an age now where obviously that PC fundamentalist, SJW fundamentalist crowd are not very happy with uh, conservative Christians. That's like, you know, they, they need their witches to burn. They need their enemies to sort of hunt down and try and get them to repent and recant and you know, cower and all that sort of thing. But, um, you know, Margaret Court's not doing that. She's somebody who sticks to her guns, um, stands up for what she believes in, um, and, and she's not, you know, like, rude or no um, mm. yeah you know she just sticks sticks with her guns and i think you know that just makes the left hate her even more so <laughs> yeah. and but no it's also very interesting what you guys said about you know about you know the the, the left seemingly targeting individuals i mean you, you mentioned margaret core you mentioned israel for lao and it just added a couple of other names to them to that as well i think um obviously george pell was one i think tony abbott was another um you're right they, they just seem to go really hard after these sort of you know, conservative Christian figures. Um, they seem to really irk the left. And um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a Christian myself, but I, um, you know, it is, it, I, I do like to observe what goes on in the society. And um, I think, you know, we are seeing a, a considerable pushback against um, PC leftist fundamentalist values. I mean, we saw it with Israel Folau, for example, when Israel Folau stuck to his guns. He didn't back down. He didn't, I mean, what, what he said was, I mean, in his tweet, he was talking about, um, you know, he was, he didn't just condemn homosexuals. He also condemned thieves and fornicators and some other people like that as well. And I, I can't remember exactly what he said in the tweet, but it was like, you know, of course, none of those people were important. The only people who were important were homosexuals. And, um, in a, and so inevitably, you know, they, they came after Israel Folau, but um, Israel Folau, you know, did not back down. He stood hard to his guns and inevitably, um, I think he, he won a lot of public support or a lot of public sympathy um, you know, because he, he did not back down. He was not bullied. He was not intimidated. He, he stamped, stood up for what he believed in. And um, yeah, we live in very, very interesting times, gentlemen. I've heard Margaret Court being interviewed many times over the years, and she just comes across as just a, a gentle, loving old grandmother. I mean, she has a very old voice. It's, obviously, when, when someone's words are, are written down, you can ascribe to whatever tone 
you want to them, but when you actually hear her, and she has repeatedly said she doesn't hate homosexuals, she has gay people in her, her church. So and she's not a foam brimstone preacher? No, no, not, not, not at all. Uh, she even said about Israel Folau, he could have been more diplomatic. In She in, said that about him. Yeah, yeah in right. his inst Instagram post, but her ch uh, Victory Life Church... Uh, in Perth, has a large following. It does a lot of local charity work. Uh, she, she was, uh, before she was married, Margaret Smith. She married uh, uh, Barry Court, who is the who's the brother of Richard Court, who was the, the WA Liberal Premier in the 90s. And their father was Charles Court, another WA uh, Liberal Premier. So uh, she's married into basically a, a, a WA uh, political uh, dynasty. And her, her Victory Life Church, they... Uh, recently uh, expanded into a, a bigger church so c uh, certainly it's, uh, she's got a, a a large flock to use the term yeah absolutely uh, g going back to what i'm saying about them targeting these individuals that um the left are very careful to make sure that they make examples of people mm. who um oppose their global homo narrative um you can't be allowed to just exist comfortably in the public sphere if you oppose what they if you oppose the narrative um it, life has to be made difficult for you and you basically like you you basically have to just be struggling to be there until you're pushed out eventually um and like when you describe like you know she's got a big following um she's married into a family with, a, with an excellent pedigree um you've got the makings of a really powerful family here um, a really powerful political force and um, cultural force to and it, it, it's like what they've got there is a big counterweight to what the left is trying to do so it, it's natural for them to go after her as hard as they as they can that's, that's what they do and of course there's no shortage of uh, washed up famous people and uh, lesser athletes who <laughs> want to make a name for themselves for yeah. uh, condemning uh, Margaret Court. And the most hilarious one was, was John McEnroe, who of course uh, was tennis's biggest uh, brat in the, the mm. 80s and 90s, uh, uh, known as by his catchphrase, you can not be serious. He destroyed uh, many <laughs> rackets in his time. He said that uh, Court uh, should, should not be, or she should basically be erased from the sport. And he referred to her as a crazy aunt mm. it's i'm pretty it's yeah that's there's a bit of pot calling kettle black there mm. so he was playing you got a, the, are you gonna a, put up the sorry yeah you're gonna charity put the photo, double yeah. match uh with uh maria navaretalova navaretalova is that <laughs> yeah close enough okay <laughs> i i always stuff up uh weird pronunciations or complex pronunciations on the air yeah, look, yeah. Um, guys, I, I used to watch quite a bit of um, tennis back in the 1980s. Tennis was a lot more interesting back then. And, um, you know, you sort of got um, Martina Navratilova was um, originally from Czechoslovakia. And um, she, I think she first won Wimbledon in 78. And then I think after she won a couple of titles, I think she defected to the USA. Because back in those days, Czechoslovakia was a communist country. Mm. And uh, Martina didn't want to be part of that. And once she had a bit of a taste of the West, she decided she didn't want to be a Czech citizen anymore. So she um, defected to the USA and she became an American citizen. And um, as for John McEnroe, I mean, obviously, you know, going back to, I can remember he was around sort of late seventies, uh, early to mid eighties. He had a period of, of real sort of dominance. He was a, a great, great tennis player as well. And, um, but, uh, I think after he had after he lost one or two titles, I think he sort of faded out of the game a bit. I'm not sure what happened to him, but he sort of seemed to disappear fairly quickly. Um, I actually saw a movie recently. I just want to mention it because it's actually on SBS World Movies tomorrow night at 7.30 p.m. I just want to mention this because I thought some viewers might be interested in it. It's a Swedish movie called Borg versus McEnroe. And it's all about the rivalry between uh, Bjorn Borg, the great Swedish player, and John McEnroe around that period in the very early 80s. So the movie actually covers, you know, John McEnroe around his super brat period. So if anyone's interested, I highly recommend that movie. It's actually brilliant. It's a super movie. 
And um, it really sort of gives you a little bit of a look at what John McEnroe was actually like back then and um, and also what Beyond Borg was like. It's a, just a fantastic movie. So when I certainly recommend to anyone who's interested in movies. Yeah, great. When I was a kid, um, we basically had this trio like we do now. Like now at the moment we have Federer, Nadal and Djokovic. Back then we had um, Lendl, Be Becker and uh, Edberg. Um, it's, I, I love the way there's always just the you know those top kind of players. Can we bring up this photo again? What yes. I find really interesting about the banner, um, aside from the fact that um, yeah, this was at uh, a, a, a legends charity yeah. match, uh, which this was against protocol, and they were forced to apologise for breaking protocol. But in fact, Yvonne uh, uh, Gulagong Arena, and she was a an Indigenous Australian tennis player. She won a few. Uh, grand slams, but of course, mm. uh, nowhere near the, the achievements of Margaret Court. And Yvonne Correct. herself, well, her last name now is Crawley. She said that she doesn't really have a problem with Margaret Court and doesn't want the oh, arena. How, how dare she? Mm. <laughs> yeah. oh, but uh, yeah, because uh, she's uh, indigenous, it's the, the, the woke replacement name. Yeah. Can uh, Are you able to expand that photo just so we can get a better look at it as well? Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll make it as large as. Yeah. Uh, um, make, make, actually, Make Australia Grass made their own version of this. Oh, right? yeah, because you can pretty much uh, put whatever you want. Yes, on so they've, they've, they've put it's okay to be white on there, yeah. So <laughs> it, do, is it just me, or does it look like they're trying to make it look like an Aboriginal rock painting? You see all the little dots all the way over there? Yeah, it's all they actually, colors, They're breaking but... more than just protocol. I think they're actually appropriating. But I don't remember. Like, it looks like rain. No, it's actually rainbow dots. That's what it looks like. Oh, okay, there. so they're basically a pro. Like, they're mixing up the rainbow flag idea with Aboriginal art. Because I don't remember those bright colours being in Aboriginal spot paintings. No, but that's what I'm saying. It's like they're converging the two. Yeah. I don't think they would have asked. I don't think they would have sought permission from any Aboriginal elders to do that. So maybe they could get in trouble for a little bit more than just breaking tennis protocol. I think right. it's probably fair to say that somebody set them up to do this. <laughs> well, they, well yeah. they still yeah. uh, did it gleefully. <laughs> I, I can just see um, John McEnroe like putting all those little sequins on there or whatever, and just chucking tantrums and throwing it all away, and they have to start again. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody yeah, he, he didn't make it. Well. Obviously, we don't know who. We know there's a lot of people involved in the, you know, yeah. the homosexual militant advocacy type movement, and um, yeah. Martina. She's a um, high profile and famous person and probably has links all over the place. And, um, you know, somebody set them up to that. Um, but once again, um, as is so often the case nowadays in the, in the culture war, I think um, it's basically an own goal from these two. Um, they haven't done themselves any favours. I mean, OK, you'll get the, you know, the LGBT militant crowd who will cheer them on for it. But I think a lot of ordinary Australians, you know, like, like us are probably, you know, thinking along the lines of, well, you know, you guys are a Yanks, you're Americans. Yeah, yeah get out of our country. What are you doing over yeah. here trying to preach to us about our values and, you know, what we should be naming our stadiums? I mean, that's just, it's the height of arrogance. It's also spiteful. It's also, you know, not taking into account, I mean, you talk about Margaret Court. I mean, it's, it's been mentioned that she's actually done a lot of work for charity over the years, but, you know, they don't take that into consideration. The only thing that's important to them is the, the homosexual agenda. So, you know, it, it's just, it's self-indulgent, it's spoiled, brat, selfish, you know, celebrity, self-important type people, you know, just rack off back to your own country and leave us alone. And when she uh, was recognised at the Open, Tennis Australia gave a commemorative trophy and the entire crowd there clapped for her. There was one solitary rainbow flag in protest. So the, <laughs> the, the crowd there, yeah. they were happy to celebrate her achievements. Well, that's, that's the thing. Shall we give it? her an on-air clap now? Will the... Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Despite the fact that she shouldn't be playing sports, she shouldn't be a minister, but, you know, good on her. She's doing well. And uh, now, Anxious Aussie has got a question. Do you think a trans woman will take her records in your lifeline? Well, possibly. Or Margaret Court, uh, she, she also got uh, uh, criticised for saying that uh, trans women shouldn't compete in women's sports, but so did uh, Martina uh, Naratulova. She said that trans women uh, should, uh, shouldn't should uh, compete because of their biological advantage, and she got dropped from one of the, the LGBT athletes yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, groups. <laughs> like, obviously, great. yeah, lesbians let, let the, are, let, let lesbians are biological uh, women, uh, but trans women are not. Yes. 
Well, she, mm. yeah, tur turfs are right on one aspect, mm. which is hilarious. Yeah, we're living very interesting times, don't we? I mean, you know, on the on the one hand, you know, Martina Navratilova's this, you know, sort of LGBT militant type, and then on the other hand, it's like, you know, hang on, she's even she doesn't want to, you know, be advocating this trans athlete stuff. You know, even she wants nothing to do with that. So, you know, it's like, you know, where where the, this whole LGBT things sort of going. I mean, I, I saw an interesting um, comment on that the other day that once, you know, it, it sort of began with tolerance and then it moves to acceptance and then it moves to celebration and then it moves to, um, you know, trying to hunt down enemies and glorification of homosexuality and then suddenly you sort of like get the, the transgenderism and all these other groups sort of try and hitch themselves to the homosexual bandwagon and then you know, it's sort of like, you know, people are just sort of like, that's just crazy. That's just going too far, you know. Yeah, then, and then fire, and then the next stage is fire and brimstone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but, you know, that, that's what's happening in the culture war. We're just, we, I mean, you know, like a few decades ago, like when I was a kid and that, I mean, you know, homosexuality was, was sort of like given a, a bit of a red light back then. Um, nowadays, it's sort of like being given a great, big, shiny, green, fluorescent light. And, um, you know, and, and we're seeing... The consequences of that i mean it just goes to another stage obviously with the transgender movement the unisex toilets it, it just sort of seems to go to new levels of insane and um, inevitably it reaches a point where ordinary people are just like you know that's far enough we don't we don't want that stuff anymore that that's going you know that's taking progressive or regressive liberal values to ridiculous over the top overreaching ultra hyper extremes and we're not cool with that and um you know it's happening in in so many fields it's not just with this transgender stuff or this you know militant homosexual stuff it, we're seeing it in many other areas so it's like you know people are just um had it up to the back teeth with political correctness and um, the pushback against political correctness is, I think, growing and building and gaining momentum all the time. I think that's effectively at where where it's at in the culture war. It's sort of like, you know, the, the loony left are just becoming increasingly loonier, but they're, they're so insistent on getting their own way on everything and ramming their own values down everybody else's neck that it reaches a point whereby, you know, the more they push, the harder they push, the stronger the resistance is now growing. And, um, you know, I think we're seeing a manifestation of that. You guys mentioned that, you know, Margaret Court was actually cheered on by, by many people. You know, lots of people were, were applauding her. and you know, That's quite inconvenient too, isn't it, eh? Yeah. Yeah. It is, and the same thing happened with the support for Israel for Lau. Again, I think that's a sort of like a, a manifestation of, you know, the, the shifting political consciousness that's occurring. And, um, you know, it's, it is what it is, and, you know, we live in very interesting times. Well, Israel Folau was also back in the news this week because he's going to be back playing uh, rugby league in the the European mm. Super League. He he signed up with the the French team, the the Catalan uh, Dragons. So apparently restrictions uh, are in place uh, to stop him uh, repeating his uh, past comments, and they've assured the. The, the Super League administration that if he uh, makes similar comments, his contract will be uh, terminated. It's like they're trying to wrap him in nuclear, like nuclear grade, like, like oh, material. Uh, put some uh, a ball and gaff on yeah, him. Yeah, pretty much. Mm. I find this in you. Know, and uh, one of the, the the first teams uh, mm. that uh, Israel Folau will, will play with uh, the Dragons is against the, the Wigan Warriors. That's Wigan's a suburb in Greater Manchester. Uh, they've announced that uh, their home game against the, the Catalan uh, Dragons uh, will be a LGBT pride uh, game where they'll wear mm. rainbow socks and that basically I, to I've, I've heard they draft. Him. I've I, I've heard that they're drafting John Hopperwaddy, especially for the game as well. <laughs> yeah, no, that's funny stuff. Um, look, I mean, I'm from Western Australia, and um, you know, I've, I've never followed rugby much at all. I mean, WA is very much a, an Aussie rules state, and that's that's the game that I, I support. So I, I haven't followed Israel for Lau or rugby all that much, and I certainly don't know much about European rugby. And I thought Catalan was actually in Spain, but apparently it's in the <laughs> they play in the French League or something, do they? I don't, I don't know. But um, yeah, look, good luck to Israel Folau, you know, whatever he does in his life sort of thing. Um, obviously, he's been a significant figure in the culture war here. And, um, you know, uh, we do live in interesting times. And, um, 
good good luck to him and his. I mean, I don't know how old he is. He must be the outside of thirty now. By now, so I don't know how how much longer he, he would have to go in his career. But I presume he's you know probably going to play for a couple of years or something, you know, however long his contract is. And then after that, he'll you know whether he fades off into the sunset or whether he you know gets himself in front of a microphone and has something to say about society and about the culture. I, I don't know. I guess time will tell. But um, good luck to him one way or the other. It's. It gives you an indication that maybe the the settlement with Rugby Australia wasn't uh, as uh, great as, as some people suspected, given that he's, he's still going to play, wants to, to earn a bit more. So Maybe he actually just likes playing rugby yeah, too, though. Yeah, but obviously, I mean, it's going to be his greatest money earner, his, his sporting career. I mean, when he retires, let's be clear, he's not going to get any... Uh, corporate endorsements or, or be an ambassador for any uh, sports programs. So he's got and, to make his money now. Yeah, yeah so true, he's got true. to basically stock up his money uh, now. I, uh, I also love the fact that his his wife went with him. His, his wife has been uh, a great example. Like She's just supported him the whole way. Well, she she's gone overseas retired at the end of last year after she yeah. was uh, dropped uh, from the, the upcoming uh, Silver Ferns. For backing him. Yeah, mm. yeah. And she... Uh, for, I, I say retirement because she probably saw the writing on the wall that she was never going to be able to play netball professionally again. Well, yeah, the ANZ had already been, um, you know, virtue signaling against her. Oh, yes, her. That, that, that great bank. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually closed my account with ANZ. Mm. I'd had an account for about, I don't know, like 20 years with them or something like that. I closed it because of that. Yeah, because yeah, uh, to refresh everyone's memory, they've uh, been the, the biggest uh, closers of uh, Patriot activists' uh, bank account, mm. or even just Patriot supporters. Mm. Yeah. So David beat them to the job. Mm. <laughs> And so, yeah, you, yeah, you, you, pu you push them away. I was like, I'm not going to wait for you to, to disavow me. I'm going to disavow <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's a golden rule. Do, do unto others before they do unto you. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> was he sacked or, or did he resign? <laughs> yeah, I sacked them. Yeah. All right. Well, the, the biggest uh, news item this week is the, the, the coronavirus. Corona uh, which uh, yeah. broke out in the, the city of Wuhan in in central china let's get let, let, let's do a, a quick poll of the listeners and also like of the hosts here is anybody upset <laughs> about the coronavirus well uh, we don't know if it's actually because uh, they talk about human to human transmission yes it, it's hard to get information about whether that has occurred or not but it's the the cases in western nations they're all uh or chinese nationals or yes of, uh, or uh, Chinese ethnicity have come it, from that it's, region. It's funny that, huh? But there, all of there, a sudden, diversity is not our greatest strength. But there hasn't been a a, a case yet of uh, transmission from Chinese person to white person. Yeah, yeah. So you know, it's it's a little difficult for me to care. Well, <laughs> where it's a racially discriminatory virus is that what is being suggested? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure. It, I'm sure eventually it won't be, but. Um, you know, it's. I'm not. I'm not shedding many tears over it. Well, we are. This studio is near Monash University, which, of course, uh, any uh, university in Australia has a large amount of foreign, i.e., Chinese yeah. just, students. Just avoid the bat soup. Yeah. Well, when I've been out and about the uh, the area, I've noticed uh, a lot of young uh, Asian students with the the medical I've uh, seen, masks I've, I've on. I've seen the same as well. Yeah. But they were wearing yeah. them before anyway. They seem to be quite concerned that <laughs> uh, they're, they're going to catch something yeah. because they had SARS in the early 2000s. But then yeah. there was bird and swine flu, yeah. and then there was Ebola, which was in Africa. Yes, um, there seems to be a, a, com a common denominator here, huh? Yeah. That uh, un uh, unhygienic, unsanitary places, because yeah. I've been seeing on my Facebook feed all the disgusting things that they've been eating, and like obviously the bat soup, but I don't want to even like I'll throw yeah. up. Just well, yeah, that, that guy who ate the live frog. Ah, yeah. yeah. And, and th there was actually a... Because this is actually what their their food programs in in China promote, and the the, the female TV presenter who ate a a bat on a television show, Chinese government got her to apologise for it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Well, my take on the coronavirus is like like Tim mentioned. Um, you know, we've sort of 
seen this before in recent times whereby you know the, the media has created this massive scare about some you know new virus that claims to you know come along and kill a few people off in a, a third world country and um you know you mentioned SARS that was was that swine flu or bird flu or something like that? SARS was, was yeah it was a it was a flu virus that was separate from swine and and bird mm -hmm. flu and this virus here is actually it it, it animals can can catch it as well it, it was from a originally from a, a seafood market in the the town of uh, wuhan right okay and also you mentioned like, ebola ebola if i can remember correctly i think there was like a ebola mark one that sort of appeared in the early 90s if i recall um, made a little bit of a noise back then and then it sort of came back a few years ago might have been about five or seven years ago i think um, sort of like Ebola Mark II and people started, you know, dying in, I think it was West Africa. Um, and I, I can specifically remember that, Sterum, and they were hyping it up so much at the time. And I can even remember that um, Bob Geldof, the um, guy who organised the Live Aid concerts back in 1985, might be a little bit before your time, Tim. Um, David can probably remember it. But, um, you know, going back to... I uh, the was, 80s. Yeah, a major famine in the top at the time in Ethiopia. Uh, this is not in eighty five, and you know people were dying of starvation, like flies because of communism. Time. That's what it was for. Oh, that, was, that was horrible scenes, horrible scenes. Or well, it was mainly because of the drought, and I'm sure the communism didn't help. But um, you know there was a horrible drought there, and lots of people were dying. And um, Bob Geldof arranged; he was responsible for arranging this massive, um, you know, rock concert it was a series of rock concerts right around the world you know there's a lot of high profile artists wanted to get involved uh, and you know raise a lot of money for the um ethiopian famine relief and um you know and sort of like bob geldof you know he made a lot of noise about that he originally had a, a big hit in 1981 i think it was with uh, a song called i don't like mondays by his band the boomtown rats which was a really great song to be credit for that and it was about a school shooter was it? Yeah, uh, oh, there was there was some. Really? I, I think she was a young girl. She shot at a a primary uh, school, and uh, when, when she uh, was, I think, first uh, questioned by police, her response was, "I don't like Mondays." Well, there we go. I didn't know that. But anyway, I mean, Geldof had sort of like you know disappeared out of the spotlight for most of um, you know for a long period of time. And then suddenly he came back a few years ago with this Ebola thing, and he decided that um, you know this was a, another opportunity for you know rock stars like him to sort of you know, washed up ex rock stars like him to sort of promote themselves, and you know he was going to arrange another massive you know celebrity type concert where all the big pop stars were going to you know teach and preach to the world about this horrible new virus that was killing all the people in Africa and how we had to show our support for the Africans and I can remember at a, just about that time that he was arranging that and getting a lot of publicity for that suddenly people stopped actually dying from Ebola <laughs> it was quite funny and then suddenly that new rock concert came to nothing it, it, it just you know it, Everybody went very quiet about it. The media shut up about it. They stopped covering it because <laughs> suddenly, you know, people stopped dying from Ebola. So, yeah, it was it was it just gave me a little bit of amusement at the time. I have to admit, but um, yeah, obviously this latest scare coronavirus. I mean, I'm taking it with a grain of salt because um, I like to think I know a little bit about microbiology. I mean, these sorts of um, you know viruses, they they do what they do. They will probably you know kill a few people here and there in you know in those sort of concentrated areas and then eventually viruses basically you could say that they burn out that's effectively what they do um to try and explain it in a nutshell it's sort of like you know what, what a lot of people don't understand is that you know we humans evolve immunity to uh dangerous bacteria or da dangerous bugs and the bugs themselves evolve to not kill their hosts. So it's that combination of those two factors that inevitably, you know, we, we see these sort of diseases. And plus, we're also living now in the in the twenty first century. So there's there's much, you know, more we're more sanitary nowadays. There's 
things are much cleaner. We've got better medical equipment. We understand the importance of washing hands and, you know, and isolating, you know, infected people from the rest of the population. So personally, I don't think that these, um, you know, these viruses are, are too much to be concerned about. I think they'll just run their natural course and, you know, people with some people with, you know, really poor immunity will, will perhaps die from them, but the stronger people with stronger immunity will, um, you know, manage to fight them off. And, you know, that that's what nature does. Um, you know, so, so. so what you're saying is we're going to have to find another way to bring China's population down to 500 million. <laughs> yeah. well, yeah, well, that's... There's been the uh, comparisons that or could be like the, the Spanish flu uh, pandemic, which killed uh, 50 million uh, people. I don't think that's going to happen. Well, uh, it, did you, you saw Black Pigeon Speaks. Uh, he was sort of doing this sort of numerical thing where like he showed that there was a pandemic, that pandemic in 1918, 1919. Um, there was a pandemic in the 50s and another one in the 60s. So it's been a while since we've actually had a pandemic yeah, and, that's killed uh, a million people. You're, you're right. Uh, Bradley, that viruses, they continue to uh, evolve because uh, evolution is, is part of all beings' existence and they want to evolve and survive as well and try and kill us. Mm. Looks like I'm being out, outvoted on the alarmism here. Then. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, just to try and exp explain that process, um, and what, what Tim's trying to say there, yeah. is, is that yes, viruses um, do effectively evolve to not kill their host. And, and the reason why is because uh, every organism wants to replicate itself. That, that's just completely natural process. And if an organism is, or sorry, if a, um, if a bug is effectively killing its host, then there's less chance that that host can pass on that bug to the next person, you see. So um, that's what bugs do. They, they effectively evolve to not kill hosts. Yeah. Uh, makes sense to, to me now. Hmm. That's sort of a more uh, scientific explanation that I just uh, provided. And we should also uh, say that obviously with the name coronavirus, everyone's uh, uh, been thinking of uh, Corona beer and there's been lots of... I actually uh, bought some Coronas yeah, just memes <laughs> yesterday. Yeah. I, I, I would like to know the, the, the sales uh, figures of whether it's uh, helped yeah. or uh, hindered sales. I... I I saw that uh, there, there's this uh, bar in Hamilton, New Zealand. Uh, they're offering a uh, a deal on Corona uh, beers while the pandemic uh, lasts. Does it come with a free bat? <laughs> and uh, people have said, oh, shame on you. And their response has been, I'd just like to say thanks to the Snowflakes for all the free advertising. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good on them. <laughs> Yeah, this is funny stuff. I mean, I was actually thinking more along the of the line of Toyota Corona cars myself. But uh -huh. They used to have one called the Corona, but so, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if it's still going. But so, yeah, no, that's some um, interesting. Yeah, no, the Mexican beer brand of Corona. Um, yeah, that, there'd be some. I remember watching a um, documentary um, going back oh, probably about five or more years ago now. It was one of those documentaries from um, the United States where they were exposing these far right white supremacist activists and i remember in that documentary they were um they were talking about corona beer and um there was a gathering where one of the white um skinhead types had been arranging like a a meeting for the other ones and um he brought a whole a whole bunch of um it was a barbecue type environment and he bought a whole bunch of uh, Corona beer, put, put Corona beer in the esky and, um, you know, because that's what they do, sort of like, you know, it's commonly a uh, common thing for people in Southern California to sort of, you know, drink Corona beer sort of thing. But what this guy didn't understand is that, um, you know, these guys were, you know, white advocate skinhead types and there was no way that they were going to drink Mexican beer, you know. <laughs> There's no way. <laughs> so they didn't touch the beer. And... Um, the guy who hosted the barbecue made sure next time that he put Heineken in the ski and not Corona. <laughs> uh, I noticed that uh, in the the UK, where uh, di diversity is not just a strength, but well, it's the law here as well. But it's even uh, more strictly enforced over in the the UK, and they're they're they're, they're cracking down on people who are using the coronavirus uh, uh, to be racist and uh, xenophobic uh, because. No, uh, just because it's all been Chinese ethnic people that have got it doesn't mean you should you, you should 
racially screen people coming from places around the world. That is in line with global homo thinking, isn't it? You're not allowed to like let the facts which are right in front of you um, like affect like your ideology. You're not allowed to let the fact that like someone looks completely different um, mean anything. Yeah. Let's just go through the actual figures as of uh, right now, and this is of course from Wikipedia, and this of course, this is from figures from obviously a communist government, so we can't trust them, yeah. uh, because yeah, the, the Soviet Union claimed that they, they didn't kill they, uh, as many millions as we later found out they did. So confirmed cases in mainland China, 7,800 deaths, 170, and then every Thailand's the second in 14 and then Australia's eight, but all the deaths have been in uh, mainland China, uh, nowhere else. And there's been a lot of uh, footage that's uh, leaked out of Wuhan. Apparently 400 Australians are trapped in there and uh, the Morrison government- Australians. Is, uh, well, uh, uh, well, I don't know the individual uh, ethnicities of them. It could just be there could just be some people on a what they thought was a holiday of uh, course somebody in the chat has alluded to apparently there was a bioweapons facility near wuhan and that it could have accidentally been released and then there's also people who believe that it's a cia bioweapon because it apparently came from mm -hmm. Uh, Canada and of course uh, China for most of 2019 were talking about what a geopolitical threat they were to Australia and the, the United States and well in 2020 they're completely preoccupied with trying to uh, contain they've not just got uh, Wuhan in lockdown but uh, several other uh, regional uh, areas what better way to basically keep them preoccupied than to release a, a super virus on them yeah it it it's convenient in that regard. Um, I'd also suggest people go and check out Vox Day. He's um, he's linked to um, uh, what is it? Uh, the, something conservative, anonymous conservative, who's done like uh, um, like a breakdown of like day by day, like the number of cases and how many fatalities, um, and has made a prediction on there, like sort of extrapolating from that for the possibility of like a million casualties, yeah. which could be quite interesting. Also, while I remember the, the bat uh, soup has uh, reminded me, of course, remember when uh, Ozzy Osbourne uh, bit the head off a, a bat <laughs> during a, a concert because he thought it was just a plastic bat that had been thrown at him, but it was a live one that was into shock. And so he picked it up and bit it. And he had to have rabies injection for, for 30 days. And if you see how Ozzy Osbourne speaks uh, today, kids don't touch bats. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, it could be all the other drugs that he took oh, that made him like that. A, a, a yeah. similar, a similar story was with Alice Cooper, um, because um, the the story went around that he he bit the head off a live chicken on stage, um, but he tells the story that like he was actually up on stage and somebody just threw a bat, uh, sorry, a chicken up on stage, and then he threw. He didn't know what to do with the chicken, so he just threw the chicken back into the crowd, and the crowd proceeded to tear the chicken apart. And so then his agent calls him up the next day and is like, "Hey." Alice, did you bite the head off a live chicken? He's like, no, no, I threw it back into the crowd. It's like, don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they, do, they, do, they intentionally spread that rumor. Yeah. Now I'm continuing to put the entropy link into the chat. So those who can log on, uh, please join us over there. I noticed that the, there's still people who are putting questions in the live chat. I know that it was anxious Aussie. They tend to just repost the... The, the, uh, the, the questions that can't get into entropy, uh, in t uh, put them in entropy on, on those people's uh, behalf. So if you feel like doing that tonight, again, anxious Aussie, uh, go right ahead. Also, uh, people have been uh, pointing out that how efficiently uh, China is uh, responding to, to building uh, new medical facilities. They're, there was this meme that was shared by a different view, and I got this from uh, Sam Newman's uh, Twitter, 
Uh, China is building a new 1,000 bed hospital in less than six days to treat victims of the new deadly coronavirus. Construction has started in the central city of Wuhan. In Australia, that would take six years, three prime ministers, 10 inquiries to be downscaled, 200 beds just to get building approval permits. Yes, correct. And Sam Newman yeah, said uh, here, Chinese city of Wuhan is building a new hospital. It's due to be completed in wait for it four days. Wonder who we could get to finish the Metro Tunnel. Yes, because Dan, uh, Dan Andrews, or as Maddie calls him, Dickie is Dan. He's having trouble building the Metro Tunnel, the West mm. Westgate Tunnel. They just had to sack a whole lot of people. Uh, yeah. East Link. He's getting into... He's, it's obviously not a very good negotiator if you cut it, like all these contractors he's getting into dispute into and there's all these cost blowouts. Well, that's typical of labor, isn't it? They, they promised that the NBN would cost a couple of billion dollars and, you know, it's, it's going to yeah, run into I, the I hundreds think of billions. there was another a news article that apparently we've got slower internet than oh, we do. world countries. Yeah, um, my place is connected to NBN and it's shocking. It drops out all the time. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's actually pathetic. We've got was um, that uh, the the most at the studio here. We have had a few, well, not dropouts, but just uh, crashes. But it's more reliable than pretty much every other internet because it's such mm. a convoluted connection. Mm. <laughs> wire cabling hmm. so, but he, here's the thing about china though it's not just the labor party it's the liberal party it's the whole democratic system um it, there's there's been a big fuss the last couple of days uh, about boris johnson allowing uh is it how huawei huawei yeah to huawei. help build the 5g network yeah um and, and people have been saying oh you know it can like they've been saying, you know, China has that surveillance state and they've got their social credit system. We've got exactly the same thing uh, here in the West, but it's just not as official as China make it. We, we, we live in a surveillance state. And as we've seen, like with um, what happened to Margaret Court, what's happening to Margaret Court, what happened to Israel Folau, um, you, there is a very clear social credit system and um, prominent people are made examples of. Um, so... China is a surveillance state that um, controls its citizens very closely, um, but it's like it's doing it from a nationalist output outlook. Like it's looking after the long-term interests of its people. Um, our own states, uh, surveillance states, they have a social credit system, and they're doing that in order to replace us. Like the whole economic system is basic is based on replacing us. Uh, so, um, uh, taking that back to, uh, to, to China, like, yeah, they can build a hospital in a few days. They, they, at least they can actually get stuff done there as well. Well, the, the UK, they're, they're leaving the, the EU uh, in the, the next 48 hours, but they've been <laughs> invited in uh, China, uh, it seems, right at the end as well. Yeah, Nigel yeah. Farage gave his uh, farewell speech to the, the European Union because he's going to become uh, unemployed by uh january quite happily by the first. sounds of it yeah yeah it, this is kind of what mark collette was saying with maddie and i last week as well like he's pointing out that um boris johnson he's at the end of the day he's still a globalist um he doesn't see them doing anything about immigration and yeah you see you know he's like okay huawei come on in um it, that's that that's not the action of a nationalist yeah that's exactly right mark um David and um, Mark was absolutely right. And, you know, we're obviously seeing the parallels in, in Australia with our um, Liberal National Government that I think has a lot in common with um, Boris Johnson and the Tories over there. Um, you know, they will, what, what they often do is they, they often signal in a patriotic direction. Mm. Um, that's what Boris Johnson did, obviously, with the Brexit thing. It was, you know, signaling patriotism. But they're not real patriots. They're not real nationalists. They'll just signal it because they know that that's what's likely to to give them votes. And they'll what what I, I call it offering scraps. That's, that's another thing they do. We've we've even seen it, the Labor Party offer scraps recently. I noticed that the other day we saw um, Tanya um, yeah Plibersek, where she, where she you know mentioned something about supporting um uh, what was it the um Australian children saying a pledge of allegiance in school or something. I mean, it was just it was crazy stuff, really. But just, in, you know, again, it, it's an example of how these politicians will sort of offer little tiny scraps in a patriotic direction um, to try to, you know, fool people into thinking that maybe they are patriotic, um, when in reality, they're not. I mean, tenure plumber's crank, as I call her, is about as 
patriotic as you know i don't know but yeah. she's not patriotic and um you know it, it it's just all spin it's just all spin um but so you have to be um very wary of um these politicians and you know mark collett absolutely nailed it as he often does um boris johnson is absolutely a globalist he's supporting uh, mass immigration into britain um, he's not part of the solution he's part of the problem and we have exactly the same problem here in australia with um scomo and his conservative government and um you know we'll see how it all pans out but unfortunately we're not living in a very enlightened time right now but i think you know the consciousness is, is shifting it's 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 changing all the time more and more people are waking up and that's a process that will continue uh we've got a, a question in entropy uh, uh, f uh from anxious aussie on behalf of port film uh, co-op who's one of those who can't use entropy question for australian protectionist party what's your policy on manufacturing in australia uh automobiles um, yeah, we've always been uh, very strongly on uh, supportive of um, tariffs in uh, Australia to protect what we call key industries. Obviously, the car manufacturing industry is a very key or has been a very key industry. I mean, I, I can remember going back to the mid 1980s, there was a statistic that uh, I think 85% of Australian cars were actually manufactured in Australia. And, you know, we, we, we've lost a lot of that manufacturing over the years obviously some of it's happened because of um, technology um, and obviously it, it is you know useful in some ways to be able to buy cheaper goods from overseas but at the same time it, it is also you know essential for a nation to have its own manufacturing industry if it can in in key areas and um, you know car manufacturing in australia i think it is something that you know we should have been protecting and um, unfortunately we're not protecting it and um, that's obviously very disappointing um, but you know we're, we're not living in a time of enlightenment we're, we're living in an age where our, unfortunately our mainstream politicians of both the Liberal and Labor parties are very dedicated to the globo homo agenda and um, unfortunately we all have to suffer the consequences of that. We don't really like because i'm a libertarian on on free trade but i i don't think that tariffs would have saved us we've shot ourselves in the the foot well uh south australia is where we made a lot of our uh automobiles and it's basically because that state uh blew up all its power stations at the highest electricity prices in the world of course it's going to cripple yeah but the car industry was struggling before that too yeah, yeah well that was also because uh of the 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 unions yes uh, absolutely. they they're they also co constantly making it uh, unviable and the same's happened in geelong in uh, victoria as well because uh, general andrews uh, said uh, blackouts in south australia i want some of that as well well you can make the argument it's a combo of all of those high power costs unions tariffs like they they, they all they've all combined to like really and also in, uh, in environmental policies green tape yep that that has also crippled the the, the car manufacturing is or in fact all industry uh, as well i mean the only heavy industry we have is getting the stuff out of the ground that we have and we're <laughs> and, they're, and they're doing their best to, yeah to use most of it here like yeah. the uranium we send overseas to china of all places but we're not allowed yeah. to use it here hmm. yeah I mean, we should not be um exporting uranium for the third world um i strongly disagree with exporting uranium not just that but we're also exporting it to uh i think it's the united arab emirates which is oh, great in the middle east and it's like you know why do we want to put you know like nuclear wow. material in the hands of these arabs um, i just think it's not very smart at all but like i said we're not living in an age of enlightenment we're living in an age where um most of the lamestream politicians adhere to sort of you know economic neoliberalism and this notion that the market is always going to be the best regulator of the society and that we can always the, trust the market to deliver the best results um whereas you know i think that's just crazy stuff And now we'll move on to, well, it's, as I said, it's a few days after uh, Australia Day, but there's a few uh, afters. Uh, we've covered on all our shows the fact that uh, Neil Erickson, Arby Yemeni, and uh, the Proud Boys were moved on from the Melbourne CBD for, for breach of the peace to accommodate. Uh, so 
the Invasion Day supporters. So did the did the Proud Boys receive a move on order from the police? Uh, well, they were threatened with arrest. Right, okay. There, were, there was around about 20 of them. Yeah, so yeah. there was obviously 20 is a lot more than just Neil Erickson and Navi Yemeni by themselves. It, it, it was interesting how it was organized. It, it seems like with, was the initial plan for the Proud Boys to basically form a protective ring around Neil Erickson. So it would it wouldn't be like I, I, the, it wouldn't I, be the lefties lynching one guy. Like it would there would actually be some protection for him this time. I think they were all doing their own thing. Okay, like the Proud Boys, they're a well, they're, they're, as you saw, they're a large group uh, by themselves. Hmm. Um, but yeah, uh, Neil obviously wanted to emulate uh, Ricky T, uh, his mate uh, fr from last year, who mm. almost got uh, lynched uh, because he was standing on the steps of Flinders Street Station with an Australian flag. And I know that Neil and Avi, they're, they're looking at uh, challenging uh, Victoria Police's authority yeah, to good. basically use this breach of the peace to get rid of anyone from the, the CBD. Well, absolutely. It's the heckler's veto, isn't it? It's it, like they were moving him on because they were worried that the left would be violent towards him. Mm. Yeah. The, the, so like rather than protecting his right to free speech, they're protecting the left's right to be violent, essentially. Well, I, uh, I also found it interesting. Um, obviously, the left, sorry, obviously, Victoria Police were keen to avoid the bad optics of having a patriot nearly being lynched by mm. his own Australian flag. So instead they got the bad optics of police ripping an Australian flag off a patriot on Australia Day. Oh, well, they, 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 t they took, uh, Neil, yeah, there's, there's a couple of videos uh, online. There's the initial mm. one he uploaded and then there's sort of more detailed mm -hmm. uh, commentary one. Yeah, they, they, he was put in the back of the police divvy van and driven uh, across town. That's what they do when they move you on for breach of the peace and say, don't come here for for the rest of the day yeah but i made the point on it was trans tasman talk uh tuesday evening that why on australia day are uh, the invasion day like it's fair enough that they're allowed to protest it's a free society but why are they allowed to go down the official australia day parade route after their protest at parliament house it's a and bit then, insulting isn't uh, it? yeah, it's the like same the one the official isn't it? australia yeah. day parade route end up at 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 the middle of Swanson and Flinders Street, where there's Flinders Street Station one side, Federation Square, hmm. there's that old pub, uh, Young and Jackson, and then there's St. Saint Paul's Cathedral. That is it's a... one of the most historic, yeah, sick, and, and iconic and parts it's of theirs. Melbourne, yeah. It's the, the people who hate Australia. Yeah. They're, they're allowed to occupy yeah. those national landmarks on that mm. day. Yeah. And Daniel Andrews and Victoria Police allowed them to. Yeah, absolutely. The other irony here is that on Australia Day, you're encouraged to wave net the Australian flag on that corner of Flinders and Swanston before midday. After midday, you'll get arrested for it, basically. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Peter V's got a, a question. Uh, Australian Protectionist Party, do you support the repatriation of immigrants, including those born here who do not fit in with uh, Australian values? Um, we've always had a policy right from the start of our party. We Hello. basically support um, what we Hello. call a voluntary resettlement type policy. Um, Australia actually already has a kind of um, voluntary resettlement policy because I can remember when we had all those boat people coming to Australia some years ago and um, the government was sort of like putting them in on detention centres to try and stop them getting onto the Australian mainland. And um, at the time, you know, there, there was an actual policy whereby, you know, the, the government agencies would attempt to resettle some of those people back in their ancestral homelands and, and to sort of like, you know, look after them, make sure that they were in a good situation, hopefully had, you know, jobs and various forms of security and that, and were looked after. And, um, you know, in principle, I think it's just a brilliant idea that some, you know, that, that we have a policy like that. Obviously, you know, you could do it with, um, obviously, you can take your pick as to which, you know, immigrant group is least desirable, if you like, if that's the right word. Um, but I mean, it, it has to be done in a way, I mean, you can't do it in a way that you're sort of like rounding people up at gunpoint and putting them on boats and shipping them out. Yeah, I mean, we brought large numbers of 
immigrants from the third world into Western countries, not just Australia, but obviously it's a problem right throughout the Western world. Large numbers of those people were brought in as immigrants over long period of time, over, over decades really. And I think realistically, if we are to, um, you know, what's the word, expropriate is, is the, the word, if, if we are to, um, you know, resettle these people back in their ancestral homelands, then yes, that would take a period of time, that, that would take maybe decades, because, you know, we don't want to do it in a way that's, you know, authoritarian or, you know, inhumane, if you like. But ideally, you know, if Western civilization is to survive, uh, if we are to preserve our white European based nations and societies and communities, then, um, you know, that's something that has, has to be on the table. And, and, you know, that goes back to also trying to like um, radically change the monetary system, get rid of the usury system, get rid of private central banking um, and, and try and, you know, give people greater financial security. Um, obviously, you know, people come to the, these people from the third world, they come to Western countries because of both push and pull factors. And um, ideally, you know, you, you want to stop them, you want to, to stop the pull factors, you want to stop attracting them to into our countries. But you also want to create a, a situation whereby there's more prosperity and security for them back in their home countries and more incentive for them to stay in their countries and not come into the Western world. Um, so yeah, obviously that has to be part of it, but it's a process and it's certainly long been one of our policies, yes. Uh, we have got uh, a caller uh, who's on hold here. Uh, I'll just bring them on. Hello? Hey, Uh, yeah, can everyone hear? It's Senator Slayer, by the way. Can everyone hear? I can yeah, I can hear uh, the bloke from the APP, though. No, uh, I can put my headphones up to the phone, which means you, if he wants to say something to you, he can. Yeah, uh, just, uh, the APP's been around for many years. Uh, I think uh, a while ago, uh, I'll get a bit of feedback here. Let's bring it back up. I think it's from here, Yeah, I'll put the... Should be right now. Yeah, I was just gonna say, uh... I got kicked out of one of their meetings a few years back, and, uh... I don't actually, uh, hold it against them, because I probably would've kicked myself out around that time, too. But anyway, uh... Everything working, or...? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's not coming through. They have every lawful right to move someone on. Based on lawful application of the law. So there's a bit of confusion as to, oh, he was moved on, so he must abide by the move on order. If the, if the Victorian police come into your home and try to move you on with no arrest warrant, no warrant for your home, you, you are not legally obliged to move on from your landlord to your kitchen because the, the law hasn't been applied lawfully. So this argument that I've been seeing, not much, but some from the left, the Victorian police have authority to move someone on under breach of peace, but it has to be based on lawful justification, if you know what I mean. So I think I think a lot of people are getting a bit confused with the uh, their rights in Victoria. So it's a arbitrary in the the judgment of the the police officers there well yeah, yeah it, it, it's, a, it's an executive power that's, that's come from the commonwealth to breach the peace but it has to be based on some sort of justification it has to be based on uh someone uh, purposely uh causing a breach of the peace it can't be used for someone standing there on their own or even for Abi yemeni for instance uh, trying to interview protesters, it has to be applied lawfully. So there is no, well, you have to follow the move on 
water because it's the war. No, it, it doesn't work like that. And, and I recently made a post today because I remember back in 2016, there was an African man that used to protest at uh, from the street intersection. And I used to see him there all the time. He protested for uh, three to four weeks, I think, in, in a row, and he used to block traffic. And the Victorian police wouldn't move him on because he was, a, he was an African fellow and he used to hold a sign that said, say no to racism. So what they did, instead of moving him off the road, uh, they actually parked motorcycles, police motorcycles around him and directed traffic around him and obliged him for three, four, five weeks. He used to do it at peak hour until there was complaints by the public where they ultimately had to move him on. So they moved him on and, and, and they weren't moving him away from the city, they just wanted to move him to the footpath, yeah? So he resisted and he was capsicum sprayed and they handcuffed him and the left jumped up and down about uh, his rights, his freedoms, etc. But here you have an African male protesting in the middle of the intersection, blocking traffic, and the police allowed him to do that for five weeks. And, and yet they can't allow a bloke on the side of the road, on, on, on the steps of the street door for. Well, you weren't obstructing anything, and let's remember the Extinction Rebellion people, they deliberately glued themselves and used all th sorts of utensils deliberately, so take the police hours, and let's not forget the, the vegans as well, they all got, it's, uh, when they got before the magistrate's court, they got a slap on the wrist, no conviction, and they, they're allowed to make a donation to a charity of their choice. Yeah, look, that's what, look, I'm... I'm a bit of a libertarian when it comes to rights. The left, they they can do that, yeah. But you have to apply the law fairly. Yeah. The problem we have in Victoria isn't isn't the laws; it's the way they're applied. And the left seem to be able to do it. That's fine; they can do it. I don't like it, and maybe there's some charges there. I don't know. But you got to apply the law equally. And I don't know. I put up a video yesterday or the day before. I ran into the the police officer who dragged me down the steps. Uh, he was a PSO officer. He had a mustache, and I uh, filmed an exchange I had with him. And I asked him why he dragged me down the steps, and he said his reply was, "You were didn't follow a move on order." I said, "Okay, what was the move on order for?" And he said, "Breach of peace." I said, "Was the breach of peace for wearing the Australian flag standing still?" He said, "Correct." So I put a complaint in with the uh, Victorian police. It's, I don't know if it's going to go go anywhere, but apparently an assistant commissioner of the Victorian police is investigating uh, the operations that day, and they're going to do a three-month investigation, interviewing the police, and hopefully I'll hear back from them. Because uh, it's got a, your video, it's got a lot of uh, mainstream, uh, uh, when I say mainstream attention, from like media uh, personalities. Yeah, I've seen a uh, Liberal MP, Craig Kelly, shared it tonight. Um, look, I, I understand, look, I don't expect all conservative columnists to to share it, if you know what I mean. Uh, but the thing is, people don't understand it. It's not about the person, it's about what happened. Um, and, and obviously, I've got a bit of a checkered past with some conservatives, but at the end of the day, this is a very good uh, symbolic... Um, symbolic uh, act that yeah. they should jump on. They should use this. Like, forget who I am. Forget that. What happened that day? And and, and it also goes to show profiling. Like, a lot of people can say, oh, but, but Neil Erickson's a political activist. He gets out there. He does this. That should be irrelevant in Victoria Police's eyes. If you have, if you have criminal record, if you have um, a bad character, it should be irrelevant under the Victorian law. Well, it seems like we're not going to, uh, this is uh, not the, the end of the matter uh, at all. And yeah, it's got a lot of people outraged that uh, this can happen well, on uh, Australia Day, but also the, the fact that, as you said, there's this executive uh, law. And I know that, yeah, Avi Yemeni, he's, he's going to take his, was he, because people saw his video where the, the police officer said they're actually going to charge him with an, a particular offence, but that doesn't seem to have uh, occurred. Yeah, interfering with police uh, duties, uh, they're going to have a hard time to win that. Like, mm. he, 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 people put themselves out there protesting in public. You want to get your voice heard. So you have people who interview you while you protest. You can't 
turn around and say that he's into general police, uh, police uh, uh, duties. They're just threatening behaviour. It's a constant thing I see from Victoria Police. They're after us. They, they scrape the bottom of the barrel trying to find charges. Um, they're going to do everything they can to shut us down. And uh, even the Milo incident where I was convicted, I still believe I was innocent. I just don't have the finances all the time and energy to fight these charges. So they're going to find anything to shut us down, and they'll use all these laws to do it. Well, you're back at court in uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, uh, you've uh, made a video about that as well. Yeah, I think the cops are going to be gunning for me now. I think uh, I'm going to be in a lot of trouble uh, eventually. But at the end of the day, it, sh it shows the pattern by uh, Victoria Police. They're profile uh, nationalists. If, just, just think about it. Imagine if an Aboriginal guy stood up there on the steps during the Australia Day Parade with an Australian flag and they dragged him to the ground while he was overlooking the Australia Day Parade. It would be literal, well, uh, the, the 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 socialist activists who protested that IMARC conference, where all the mining executives were at, they uh, complained relentlessly that uh, police brutality, and even claimed that uh, the police officer who did the the, the OK uh, sign uh, was a racist. They, they were Well, we shall uh, see. And uh, your your next uh, court date, when's that? Uh, February 18th. Um, I've got the uh, special LGBTI uh, Victorian police. Uh, they wear rainbow coloured uniforms. Uh, they, run a, they run a radio station where they uh, call for um, religious parents who, who don't identify or don't accept their child's gender identification uh, to be referred on to DHS and other police uh, organisations. They talk about taking names of uh, Victorians who are against gay marriage, putting them on the police computers. Uh, they call people like us idiots, undesirables, uh, and they all laugh about this. This is Victoria Police. This is what they are. And there's over 300 LGBTI police officers who go around and are you talking are about police like oh are they police officers who are lgbt or is that their official title no their official title is lgbti liaison officers they're actual victorian police and what they do is it's like a special activist group within victoria police so the victorian police aren't a police force anymore they're an activist and lobbyist group these lgbti police officers refer charges to victoria police for homophobic incidents and they've been on record multiple times asking the public to call up and report mm. homophobia. Homophobia is not a crime. Why are they asking the general public to report homophobia? They're doing it because what they do is they replace that law, the non-existent homophobia law, with another law, such as disturbing religious worship. They go through the law for looking, oh, let's get him for something. Because he's homophobic, he's upset someone, there's no law for homophobia, let's find something. And that's what they do. And that's what they did to me at that gay church in Hawthorne. I broke no laws. I asked for permission to address the congregation. I was given permission. So what they did is they had secret meetings before the investigation even started. They talked to the witnesses. They coached the witnesses. And then they got the witnesses on board to lie in their statements and basically say all the right things to match the elements of the charge. Well, and from what you told me, it's a, a contest uh, hearing. So all that, uh, uh, I assume, uh, will be... Uh, will be said uh, there. Yeah, definitely, definitely. But it's just, yeah, it's just the Victorian police are no longer police; they're political activists. That's what they are now. Not all of them, but a good percentage of them. Well, we'll we'll see how this all uh, plays out. Uh, I myself, obviously, if they may have a political agenda, the the leadership or or, or some of them, but uh, I think there'll be some reflection and some optics PR management. So we'll watch the story closely. All right, mate. I'll catch you later.
Bye. Cheerio, Neil. Now, the other aftermath uh, of... I'll put my headphones back in. And the Even though the, the left, they want to... Well, not just change the date, abolish Australia, they want to abolish Australia, they still seem to care about the Australian honours system, of even course. though it's something we inherited from England. And so yes. they, they want uh, Bettina Arntz, uh, uh, AM uh, member of the Order of Australia, uh, revoked, she got it for uh, gender equity and men's rights uh, activism and Jill Hennessy, the Victorian General, and Attorney General wrote to the Governor General saying it should wow. be uh, revoked. It's, it's amazing that they were able to get that from such high up. Yeah. yeah. And remember, that's the same Attorney General who had her legal counsel uh, at uh, Blair's appeal trial. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, you can't have anybody up there uh, con contradicting the narrative. Mm. Yeah, because yeah. Uh, Rosie Batty uh, condemned uh, Bettina Arndt's uh, honour, so... Wow, yeah. Yeah, um, hi, just cutting in there. Um, yeah, look, um, I actually watched Bettina Arndt tonight. She was actually on the Bolt Report on uh, the Sky News Channel, and um, it's quite interesting because, um, I mean, she, she wasn't, you know upset about it in one sense at all so because Bettina aren't the sort of person who you know the, the left have been you know attacking her for quite some time um, but I think she actually revels in it I think the, she she's one of those people that the more you sort of attack her instead of her sort of like cowering in the, in the corner she is going to come out swinging and um, you know she was on the boat report tonight and she was vehemently defending her position and she was i mean you're right it's absolutely unprecedented that a, a a state government minister would specifically write to the governor general because she objected specifically to um you know one person getting the um order of australia i mean how many times has that happened before i mean clearly this is highly politically motivated Obviously, Bettina Arndt has been blacklisted in the eyes of the sort of, you know, feminazi cabal or whatever they are. But, um, yeah, it's, 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 we live in interesting times, but, you know, it's all sort of grist for the mill. Um, I think Bettina Arndt is, um, she's a big girl and she'll look after herself and um, she's, um, you know, she's in the media and she's defending herself and, um, you know, and promoting herself and, um, you know, she's jumped on this cause of um, defending men and taking on the, the feminists and of course she's not the only one we see you know Sydney Watson doing it and Daisy Cousins doing it and I'm sure there will be many others coming after them it's uh, it's all part of the the shift in consciousness that's occurring it's all part of that you know radical progressive or regressive leftist overreach they're trying to sort of ram their hyper feminist values down everybody else's neck and inevitably there's that resistance to it more and more people pushing back against it and um, you know, it's really good to see Bettina Arndt standing up for herself, and I guess we'll probably observe more and more of that sort of thing. It's sort of, you're amazed, uh, or pleasantly amazed that she got the, the honour in the first place, because it is uh, the, the Order of Australia Council, they get together and decide. I went through the list of, of people who are on the, mm. the, the, the council on Monday. It's a diverse group. Obviously, there's some people who'd be associated with the right, some okay. are left, and I assume they come to some sort of consensus. And so this obviously would, would have been, I mean, they only have, that's their, their sole job is to who's in the order of australia and so do you, do you think maybe the lefties on the panel thought they'd better throw the right as a fig leaf or two perhaps yeah. i mean they last year they they gave jane caro the the online uh feminist uh writer a, a order of australia even though uh she recently condemned tenure plibersec for saying that uh students trans students should recite the the pledge of allegiance and for saying she wanted to go to new zealand after the a federal election to live under Jacinta Ardern. So she obviously doesn't like Australia very much, but she was happy to take the honour. <laughs> yeah. What was what was the name you had for Plebersec again, Brad? A plumber's crack. Um, sometimes I call yeah. it Blabbersec as well. Mm. I think I think <laughs> I, I had. Yeah. I make, boys, I, I make up a lot of names about yeah. politicians. I'll go through a few others just for your your amusement. If you're yeah, interested. Please do. Call, please do. I call Adam, Adam Bant. I call him Adam Bantamweight. Um, Bantamweight is lighter than a lightweight. Um, I call Richard De Natale. I call him Richard De Nutter. Hmm. Um, or Penny Wong, Plenty Wrong. Um, How about uh, how, uh, my favourite one for her is Fanny Pong. Uh, Sarah Hanson Young is Sarah Hanson Dung with a D. We all know what that is. Um, 
you know, yeah, I mean, I'm a bit of fun with this sort of thing. I think we, we all can. Um, you know, the left deserve to be mocked, and um, that's what I call it. Tanya Plummer's great. They, they have names for us. It's only fair, yeah. They, yep. they, they've gone after Bettina, right? Well, they'd been after her for a year because of a, a, a controversial uh, interview that uh, she did uh, with a man, uh, Nicholas uh, Bester, uh, who'd been uh, convicted and sentenced to two, two years, uh, 10 months in jail for having a sexual relationship with a 15 year old student uh, in uh, Tasmania. And I haven't seen the full interview because it was deleted off YouTube because he named uh, his victim uh, but uh, what's played is that she presented his plight in a sympathetic way and she talked about how male teachers they're uh, at risk uh, from the seductive power of uh, uh, teenage yeah. uh, girls mm -hmm. And uh, also the fact that she also has defended uh, George Powell. And uh, they, they've also claimed that she's misrepresented her qualifications because she's a trained clinical psychologist, but she doesn't practice clinical psychology. She's not registered in that. So they're claiming that uh, she, she's she's mis uh, that, that she's a fake doctor, which she never, so she never claimed that she was a... A, a, a doctor, she's never been introduced as Dr. Uh, Bettina Arndt. So they're really bringing out the big guns. Oh it's, yeah, there was yeah. a new Matilda uh, expose mm. uh, on her going going through uh, all this. Interestingly, um, uh, Adam Piggott has written up a piece, I'm going to put it up on the XYZ in a few days time. Um, he's called it Fear No, Fear no Twitter. And he's pointed out that um, a Twitter storm um, or a Facebook storm, whatever, it's it really shouldn't bother you because like you don't have to read this stuff like it's not people coming up to you getting in your face uh it's not people breaking into your house or you know like assaulting you it's just people rabbiting on so yeah that's right and that's right yeah. gentlemen it, another very um wise saying to remember is that today's headlines are tomorrow's fish and chips papers people have very <laughs> absolutely short and, and short memories and um yeah. so yeah you're right. You shouldn't be too concerned about Twitter storms. Yeah, and I hope I hope Bettina uh, sort of treats this the same way. Like just oh, she yeah. she is tough as nails, yeah, and good. she's good. Uh, refuted. Uh, all of their the accusations well Excellent. make sure that she is properly defended she's 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 gotten the line den's gone on uh, studio 10 uh, 3aw with neil mitchell where mm. they've yeah interviewed her rigorously about uh, all the uh all, all all the the controversy recent controversies uh surrounding her mm, good mind you she sh shouldn't be allowed to work professionally but um yeah that's my opinion <laughs> <laughs> Well, she's been, she's, uh, she's now, well, she turned 70 last year. She's been around si uh, since the, the 70s when uh, she, she was one of the, the leaders of the, the sexual revolution, uh, teaching Australia about sex and how um, uh, me, uh, well, particularly women could uh, properly achieve orgasms. Mm. So what you're saying is she's a liberal and uh, she brought it on herself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're, you're very... <laughs> I'm just, you know... <laughs> Uh, what is it, Shirai posting here? Mm. Uh, yeah, what Shirai posting? Yeah. Even though you you sympathise with people like Bettina Arndt and Margaret Court, you still well they shouldn't have done this, shouldn't have done that. Well, you know, you you've just got to keep pushing that Overton window. You know, someone's got to be on the edge. <laughs> I think we're we're reaching the end of the show now. Obviously, over in the the US, the Senate impeachment trial continues, uh, but it seems that there's a, enough uh, Republican rats in the Senate that. Uh, uh, some uh, witnesses uh, could be called who are keen to uh, dump on President Trump, uh, such as... Uh, Bolton. Ne Sorry? Bolton. Yeah, John yeah. Bolton. And when I say Republican rats, I'm talking about people like uh, Mitt Romney. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's... It, I, I, I haven't followed it too much. Um, yeah, I found red elephants uh, he, like um Vin vincent james he was saying basically people were warning donald trump not to have anything to do with john bolton yeah it's yeah. his fault like even though he'd made the right thing uh firing him yeah. he shouldn't have hired him in the first place like yeah. this is the the biggest frustration that america first is have with trump why has he surrounded himself with people who are neocon deep state 
people. Like Pompey is still there. I, I keep saying he he knows what happens to, happened to JFK. That's that's literally my theory. Yes. I'm not even wearing and a tinfoil hat. That's actually my theory. Yeah. Which is why he ends up doing the right thing, even though he sort of got himself into yeah. like the, the with the uh, or the the nearly fizzer World War Three. Uh, that 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 was another big nothing burger. But why did mm. he need to escalate in the first place? Why did he need to withdraw from the Iran deal in the first place? Uh, yeah, I, I I hope this. 4D politics going, 4D chess going Yes, we yeah. know we know that he's the master of that. And he also announced uh, that there was going to be a new uh, uh, Israeli-Palestine uh, peace uh, settlement as well. With uh, announced this with Benjamin Netanyahu, where uh, yeah. the Israeli settlements uh, in the West Bank are allowed to uh, remain. Uh, Palestine cannot uh, raise an army. Uh, anything uh, like that. So it's basically there'll be a two-state solution with the the status quo, and uh, is well, Israel's going through another election because they keep having hung parliaments, and mm. Netanyahu's just been indicted for uh, fraud and s some other corruption charges as well. Yeah, if if this is 4D chess, it's it's a real wild one. Mm. I, I don't know what way you're going to go with this because like the Palestinians aren't going to accept it. Like, no, well, they're never yeah. going to accept anything. I, yeah. I mean, Israel, but, but, is but even this one, like they're, they're basically saying, okay, all the settlements on the West bank and Gaza will now be part of Israel. Like the Palestinians, there's no way they're going to accept that. And, no, yeah. well, they are, uh, they're not going to accept a lot of them won't accept anything except basically, uh, all of the, the 1967 lands back and then some. Yeah. Um, again, I'm, you know, uh, we should never have given, uh, any of, um, Palestine, uh, to either the Israelis or to it the Arabs. It should still be British Palestine. Yeah. Like, like we, like when we launched the crusades, um, we took the Holy land and it became a crusader, um, state, um, uh, nearly a thousand years later um we finally get the place back and what do we do we just give it all away we should never have given it all away it, it's it's european territory it, it used to be part of the roman empire it should be ours um and th that's that, that's my solution that's it's my one state solution yeah all right uh, bradley have you got anything to to add because i think we'll wrap this up now uh, no not on that specific issue I will thank you for, for joining us, uh, Bradley. I know that, yeah, you, uh, three hours uh, behind, so you had to start relatively early. It's it's way past uh, 10, uh, 10 p.m. here in Melbourne, and we've just had a scorcher today. It's going to be a scorcher again tomorrow, but there's no uh, dire bushfire uh, predictions uh, that, that I've heard, which basically everything that... Will, burnt uh, that could burn has now been burnt mm. and it's also snowing in saudi arabia mm. yeah yeah i actually heard that as well yeah. um yeah look uh, thank you so much for having me on gentlemen it's been an absolute pleasure um mm. yeah i just want to mention um i'm part of the australian protectionist party um, we've got a website www.protectionist.net and we're on facebook we're on twitter we're on gab and um, yeah, please look us up and um, follow us, Australian Protectionist Party. Beauty. Thanks very much for coming on, Brad. It's much appreciated. Thank you so much. And of course, we'll do our uh, end of show uh, plugs. Of course, I'll be back uh, Wilms front uh, tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Li live on uh, my YouTube and uh, DLive channel, uh, Tim Wilms. My guest will be China expert uh, Dave Lee, because of course, the, the big debate is that bioweapon or, or bat soup, uh, Dave Lee tends to come down on the side of the the, the, the bat soup, and he's got a, a source inside Wuhan who's uh, providing yeah. him with... Uh, uh, footage. A source. Huh? Um, uh, yes, I, I'm glad you're getting Dave Lee. He's done yeah. some really good stuff for quite a long yeah, time. You can yeah. find him on, uh, he's not just on, on YouTube, he's also on Facebook, where he also has a group, uh, uh, Australian Born Europeans, where he's posting a lot uh -huh. of these uh, videos Excellent. from China. Excellent. Um, and you can see me with Maddie's Modern Life at nine o'clock on Monday nights at Maddie Rose Live. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of fun. Mm. And um, I've also been doing podcasts with Mark Moncrief and sometimes Mark Richardson from Melbourne Traditionalists. Uh, just check the XYZ. Um, we post them up whenever we have one ready. 
And of course, on Saturday, it's Maddie Rose live uh, yeah. solo. That's that's always lots of fun where he goes through his favorite articles. He's uh, doing off. some good work. I've been enjoying him. I've been enjoying trolling him in the comments. <laughs> Uh, he seems to every week. He seems to have a a server. That is what is it now? Nemesis uh, Devia. Ah, uh, and rightly so. Yeah. Uh, I'm back uh, five nights a week. Uh, Wilms Front is uh, seven p.m. Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and of course Trans Tasman ta Talk uh, uh, with uh, editor of Right Minds NZ, Dewey De Boer, is live on the Unshackled YouTube channel at seven p.m. Uh, live and well of course we still do this uh, uh, w uh, once every week and I know that there's gonna be something very special being announced on this show next uh, Thursday but I don't think uh, I haven't uh, got it's embargoed I can't say yet okay but yes, so you can uh, catch up on my own uh, Wilmsfront uh, shows, uh, teamwilms.com, of course, the latest from the Unshackled, the uh, unshackled.net. Beauty. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much, everybody. Much appreciated. Thank you. Good night.